This week on Bros, Bibles, and Beer. If the church is creating atheists, it's a problem. Jesus says and does all of these things. You say you follow him, and yet you treat me like shit. He went through restoration, and maybe he is restored. This is the type of thing where it's like, okay, be restored and go to church. You don't be restored and get to be on the board of a church after something like that. Sometimes the churches are so like, no, we have to keep numbers, our people, numbers, numbers. and we need our donations, and we need to keep this thing going. Not one church is right for everybody. Let it be shown uh, that Andy really wants to go down this rabbit hole. I think she go down the rabbit hole. Maybe no, we'll, no, no. We'll Wait, he it. said rat hole, technically. But, All right. Did I say rat hole? You Put said a button rat hole. Nice. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Bros, Bibles, and Beer. I am Andy McCraw. This is episode 239. Zach Crater. Let's get mystical. I want to hear the spirit talk. And Dave Ritchie. Moving up to the big leagues. Oh, we're missing Jeff, but we do have producer Nate in the house. Nate? I'm here. Oh. <laughs> You are here. Yeah. Statement of fact. <laughs> it is your birthday. <laughs> oh, man. Welcome to Bros, Bibles, and Beer, where we like to have serious conversations on faith and culture, whilst not taking ourselves too seriously. And uh, yeah, we got Dave Dave Ritchie back in the house. Guest Hello. bro. Guest bro in lieu of Jeff, who is traveling the world with his son for baseball tournaments. I know. Tonight, you're outside from behind the board. You're not just uh, helping man the show. Now you're a man on the show. It's good to be here. It's been a long time. <laughs> it has been a long time. So when was the first... This isn't the first time you've actually been a guest on the show. Like, wh what episode do you think? Uh, it was probably episode 10 or 11. Jeff would say 11. <laughs> Probably say eleven. Obviously say eleven. 11. Uh, yeah, it was a while ago. And yes, you said two thirty nine. Yeah, two thirty nine. We have been around that long. So get into our. If you're a new listener, get into our back catalog. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your finer podcasts. And Spotify, uh, Apple, YouTube. Yep. Subscribe on YouTube. Uh, leave us a voicemail. Speakpipe dot com slash bros. Catch us on all the socials at Bros Bibles Beer. Correct. And we uh, shout out to a few new subscribers on YouTube, Jeff Gilbert, Jacqueline Vinson, Adam Godfrey, Trevor Sullivan, and Susan Adams. I got fat fingers. I typed Sazen, but I know it's Susan. Sazen. But Sazen Adams. It feels good. Two out of 40% of those are, are lady. I lady, like lady bros. 40% lady bros. Thank you. And I appreciate that. Not Most of the bots who subscribe to us aren't ladies. Correct. Factually correct. <laughs> All right. So I think tonight what we're going to get to is, 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 is the greatest single cause of atheism in the world, the church. And I've got a quote that will make that statement. And so we'll, and we, and we've got a couple clips in that regard that we will play. But first, should we get into it with the secret sin? What is the secret sin? Oh yeah, invading Christianity, according to one Melissa Duggerty, D Do <laughs> Doherty. Doherty on Instagram and YouTube. She is a pretty well-known Christian influencer slash apologetics. Nate, pull that up on the uh, screen. There, we'll we'll get that one dialed in. Nice. All right. empty feeling of never feeling like God loves you enough because you don't have super spiritual experiences all the time. Then imagine you manufacture those experiences to fill that void that you have created. What I'm describing is mysticism, where you purposely seek a divine spiritual encounter for the purpose of power, maybe to feel super spiritual, manifestations of glory, Take your pick. Experience then becomes your truth. And don't put God in a box is a common phrase told to those who would question these things as being outside the realm of how God functions. The bottom line is that it comes down to this. If you've never had one spiritual experience, would Jesus alone be enough for you? Imagine Ooh, that's the empty- good. Mm. I like the way that she sums that up at the end. For you guys, if you uh, kept touching your microphone, would you still be a podcaster? <laughs> Zach. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. That's in his head. I actually don't like the part the way she ends it. I don't like it. Maybe you can tell me why you do like it. I do like it because 
I know a lot of people who would say that they they don't have um, what they would describe as spiritual experiences, and they long for that. And for them, that there the uh, the unspoken message there is that um, knowing Jesus isn't enough. Yeah. So how do we know? Jesus, I, I guess maybe I'm picking nits in my brain. How does she know Jesus? Like ultimately it's going to come down to some sort of experience. And so where those experiences and seeking those experiences for a lot of Christians, it's just like for most of my life, I, I'm not somebody who's had giant mystical experiences, but there's been a couple times that have kept me anchored into some sort of like, okay, there's something going on outside of my materialism, because for the most part, I'm a material guy where it's like, show me the data kind of a thing. I want to know. So, but a couple experiences that have, okay, there's something to this faith. It might change. It might look different than in in my childhood, but there's something going on more than I can explain. But for the most part, my entire life, it's just been, no, it's been you go to church, you do the things because that's what you should be doing. You read the Bible, but not having some of the more ecstatic experiences that you see in some of the charismatic maybe, places. So, so you and can, being secretly jealous sometimes. You teased it a little bit, so maybe it's good for us to describe what knowing Jesus and maybe what is our uh, our definitions of that and what uh, a spiritual experience, how we would define that. Because I bet we might not all use the same description of each of those things yeah well i'd say that if you're well i think zach and i and maybe you we grew up in the faith yes so we were born into it so we kind of don't have that shine it's kind of all we know so i tend to feel like maybe we don't we don't have that one moment that changed like we were born again the first time yes originally or OG. <laughs> Pre-born again. <laughs> but like you don't have that experience of like, oh, I had a spiritual experience and that's what brought me to Jesus. So not that we don't have experiences, but I don't think maybe we... we There was no clear conversion experience that you point to where I would say, where you would say, um, before this moment, um, I, I didn't believe and then I had an emotional, spiritual experience that changed that changed me right and and moving on like that's jeff's description yeah uh, he would say he and it's his conversion experience but lots of people have i mean there's a a wide variety of conversion experiences sure well and i think like you go on men's retreats and different things and you can have experiences then yeah which sometimes i feel like people maybe aren't they want to have an experience so bad they maybe are missing them so what's Oh, they're missing the forest for the trees kind of a thing. Like it's, yeah, like they're looking for whatever their expectation is and it's just like right think, in front of them. I think that's part of what she was describing there is that that there is a maybe a personality type that elevates the chase of a spiritual experience above anything else. Mm-hmm. And sometimes at the risk of misunderstanding or misinterpreting events and saying this is God when it's like, well... No, you may have just hyped something up to believe that it it was God, that it was a spiritual experience, but maybe it wasn't. Oh, yeah, for sure. And I think one of the things, you know, it, it is a YouTube short, so it's probably part of a broader conversation or she, things are going without being said. So we're assuming some things. Uh, so there might be context missing, but the mystical thing she brought up, I'm going to s- just assume certain types of meditation, like meditating on the word of God is a biblical thing. It's mentioned as something you do, like thinking, contemplating over the word of God. I don't think she would be against that, but she would probably strong caution or um, caution strongly against certain types of meditation where you're repeating mantras and you're trying to get into a zone or a trance in order to trigger an experience. And I would, there's a time where I'd be like, yeah, don't do that because you could be inviting something in that you don't know, you know, you yeah. can't control. These days, I'm like, it just depends on what you're focusing on. What are you, what is the fruit of what you're focusing on? What is your goal? Um, 
because you can find data for certain types of meditation being very good for you and very good for your brain that a lot of Christians on the more conservative pick, side would really... That's fine. That Yeah. I, y- caution against because you might invi- open a window into the Dark Lord's butthole. <laughs> that's actually what the science says. That should be a bumper sticker. Uh, all meditation is not <laughs> controversial. To some Christians, actually, it is, but probably most Which, most it, Christians it, are it okay is biblical. with. It does it does say that to meditate on the word? Right, that's in the Bible, the actual Bible. I think what you're describing is people who are looking for like some sort of transcendent experience where they're getting outside of themselves, transcendental meditation, and opening, opening themselves to other influences, and maybe doing so in a way that is uh, just questionable. Yeah. Uh, so, like the manifesting and the, so, like you going down that road as far as meditating, manifesting. Yeah, you literally might be opening something up to the spiritual realm that you. Let's don't start want from the to. beginning. Have you seen Ghostbusters? I have seen <laughs> Ghostbusters. <laughs> okay. All four of them. Great. That's what everyone was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> then basically that. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. If you're. Uh, the key master. If you find yourself <laughs> claiming to be the key master, maybe something's wrong. Gatekeeper. Yes. Uh, so what I imagine, yeah, most people will, will say, hey, you are opening yourself. If you're opening yourself generally to, to that, I think that's one piece, but I don't think that's what she's talking about. I think what she's talking about more is the over-spiritualization of, of your life in general. It's, it's, uh, searching for additional meaning or activity that's happening in your life that isn't really there, and you're doing it because you're trying to manifest this sort of type of this experience because you're chasing that type of experience and emotion. The, the, that's how I interpret that. Do you guys? Yeah, I see that. Agree. I agree. I I see from that perspective. I the thing that jumped out to me was when she buttons it with like, isn't Jesus enough? It's sort of bumper stickery. If you're an average evangelical, you're going to have an idea what that means. Yeah. But also you're not maybe thinking of like, yeah, your experience, just have Jesus. Don't rely on your experience. But how do you have Jesus? But through experience, even like reading the Bible and reading about Jesus, you're reading an interpretation of Jesus that was experienced by people and translated and passed down to you. And then whatever, Jesus is in your mind is a product of your experiences. And so, well, you can go too far. Is like, knowledge an experience? You, you're interpreting it through your experiences always. I don't think you cannot do that. I guess I can't sign up for just calling everything experience because that sounds like that's what you're doing. But there's a slide if you're not doing that, then well, say it differently. I might be using my words. Use your words better, Zach. I might be doing it poorly, but let's say the benefit of the doubt for her argument, the far end of what's wrong from her perspective and, and maybe most of ours is I'm seeking experience there. I had an experience. Therefore that is my absolute truth. And I think all of us are against that. Like I'm against, Oh, it's my experience. Therefore it's correct. I always want to be testing my experiences to make sure they're correct. But to say like, isn't Jesus just enough? none of us get to see Jesus now. So we all have to put together a picture of what Jesus is like in our mind based on reading the Bible and our Mm -hmm. prayer life and meditation, whatever, which is going to get filtered through our previous experiences. And so, and that's not wrong. It's just, she's on, I feel like she's kicking the can down the road. She thinks she's putting a button on it, just Jesus. But ultimately there's always experience and we shouldn't ignore that either. And that's not always, experience isn't always wrong. That's not what she, I don't think she's, yeah, uh, that, last, that, that is, last line is a little problematic, but I don't think she's saying that having experience me, is wrong. I don't, I don't think, I don't, I would not say having a spiritual experience is wrong. I think she's saying it's, if that's your focus, looking for it, if, if, if you're trying to over index on that and, and it's the person, again, I, I think the better way to describe it is over spiritualizing and maybe, uh, maybe in, 
let's can we use that as a working definition right now for mysticism? Sure. Because we're all dumb and we don't know what we're talking about. Agreed. Okay. Um. So so we, I think we've all encountered that person in our lives before, who who over spiritualizes and sees inaccurately we would say sees god in every single thing and sometimes it's like that was that was just a barking dog though like it wasn't it wasn't the spirit telling you maybe you should move to tennessee all you people who've been moving to tennessee yeah i feel like the spirit has been telling everyone to move to Tennessee from California. <laughs> That's what they think. <laughs> yes. But then how many of those people are now regretting it? Did they, in, were they over-spiritualizing? So is that, does that, anyone that says, oh, praise Jesus after everything? Does it include those people? No. No. Okay. Uh, Jesus, it's, it's, Jesus it's a cousin. A, it's a close cousin to yeah. what Andy's talking about. Like my mom. I mean, I love her, but like everything is praise Jesus. Oh. oh. Oh hey mom, you Biden got reelected. Praise Jesus, right? <laughs> well, Am that I not, right? That would mom? not be the conversation. But <laughs> sorry, you're gonna but say yes. Something. Uh, Close. So I, I, I always remember this. We had a friend. We were in a small group for ten or twelve years, and um, one of the women in our small group always talked about how hard it was for her being a Christian. She, she come to Christ later in life. I think she was maybe um, early 30s, late late 20s. Um, so she had a good chunk portion of her life where she was not a Christian, did not know Jesus. Anyway, the, the point that she would make consistently was that she almost mourned the fact that she didn't have spiritual experiences. And and she felt like it was this huge hindrance to her in her um in her general experience as a Christian, like she would pick Sunday mornings, for example, and um, worships or worship time, and and would say, "Yeah, I, like I don't, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm feeling the things that like other not people connecting. I, I'm not, I'm not. If I look at the person next to me, they seem emotional about the thing, mm-hmm. and and I don't have that. And she felt lesser, uh, in in who she was, and and so many times we were like. That's not how it works. Right. And so, like, for example, because I've not, we talked about this before, because I've not heard audibly from God, if my lacking in my faith is my spiritual journey, like, less than people who have, I think it's just different. Now, I'm not going to criticize her to say, like, it, it does seem like a wonderful thing. And, and, that, and I could see how you would want to have those feelings. But, don't be like that shouldn't be the thing you're chasing but how did she come to jesus if she uh, didn't have an experience did she just like well i'm just going to join something no 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 uh, i didn't say she didn't have an experience but what i'm saying is she she She's would say she didn't she on a regular basis yeah. um did not have spiritual experiences mm-hmm. okay. now by the way a lot of people would say they come come to um like lo- through 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 logic through reason would say hey this this makes sense to me I see, I, I, I see and believe the person of Jesus Christ and, um, and, the, and I've experienced or recognize empirically the people who say and believe the things that he, he said, that seems like a good thing to do. I'm going to do that. It seems, it, it seems like the right thing to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so that's the, I was thinking about the Wesleyan quadrilateral. Sorry, I'm talking a lot here. It's all right. But like the, like experience is a piece of that. And tradition, tradition, scripture, and, and reason. Uh, yeah, Domino's Pizza is the the fourth one. Okay, Domino's. yeah. Well, that's then I'm out. I can't. Can I touch do your mic too? The Wet- West Wesleyan can we all, can we all touch your mic? Yeah, if you want to. <laughs> um, well, maybe this is like, hey, leave us a tip on Instagram. You can do that now, <laughs> and that way we can buy better stands. Oh yeah, <laughs> there we go. Um. My my experience, so the logic thing it is near and dear to my heart. Yeah. You know, listening to me talk, I know you might think, oh, that guy's not very logical. Um, but it was logic. I was really into apologetics and like having rational explanations for everything. And it was logic that led me to question things and following logical rabbit trails yeah. that led me to 
D and reconstruct and come to a different sort of faith, sort of post evangelical Christianity, you know, whatever that definition is, some version of that, because I'm not, I, I am an experiential guy and I'm an emotional guy, but I always want to counterbalance that with like, okay, let's think about this completely. And yeah. I, I don't always do that perfectly, but that's kind of the logical aspect and explaining things and questioning is like a constant part of my life. So I appreciate that. Dave, do you remember what you were going to say? Cause you were starting to talk when I talked. I don't. That's okay. I'll okay. come back. I did. The term oh, came to my- again. <laughs> Well, I think to kind of, from the way you introduced this segment, basically the ser- people that are not finding or connecting or having these experiences feel like they should have these experiences. Therefore I'm not having experiences. So I'm going to be atheist. Something's wrong. Yeah. I don't believe. Or, yeah. Well, that- and there is something uh, uh, eventually, I think a lot of, there's probably a lot of people who are like, I'm, I'm not, I don't feel it anymore. And, and so how do you, if you don't have the, I, I don't know how to say this the right way, but if, if there's a lack in your connection, your relationship with Jesus, if that, if that's on thin ice already and you're relying on emotional energy to get you through, when those emotions go away, then what do you have left? Yeah. Yeah. I think that the church in general doesn't do a great job of promoting going and finding where you're fed. So a lot of people will join a church and just like, this is my church and I'm here yeah. and they may not be connecting and it may not be the right place for them. Mm-hmm. But most churches won't say that. It's hard though, Dave. It's hard to find people to it, join a church. It, it, it can be, but you know, you get go in down, where you fit in. You go down the street and you might <laughs> connect and then you have those experiences. Or whatever it is. Yeah. But I, I think yeah. part of the problem is sometimes the church is the worst thing for, you know, God, Jesus, religion, whatever you want to say. Like the local church, particular local church, not big C church. Correct. But a particular local church might be the worst the thing building. for a particular individual. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um Yeah. Do you do you have anything is there anything under the hood there? Like well, from I based just, on your experience, uh, I mean, I just I feel like you know, as growing up in the church and being to a, a few different churches, you know, I think as you grow and if you as you get seasoned, you tend to. I mean, I think you have the ones that are like I'm a I'm a lifetimer. I'm at this church. Sure, no I'm a lifetimer. What. I'm here. This is my church. Yeah. Then I think there's the other ones that as you mature, you're like, you know what? I need to go find. Like maybe I'm sedentary, you know, like I'm not, I'm not growing anymore. I need to go find something different. And you reach that point and then you go find someplace else. You find another church, find another community yeah. and you start to grow again. You start to thrive. So I, I think. That's hard, man. That's, that's hard because. It's hard. I in, did intent, unintentionally with the Jordan. It's hard. It's hard to know. It's hard because you're balancing. If you've been in those, I, I can think of a time in my life where we were in that place and. Um, you, you are simultaneously like building and investing in relationships with other mm-hmm. people and those can be rich and fulfilling, but there can be the other part that's missing. Right. And it sucks when you're feel like you're in a place where you're having to do that trade off and you're like, well, I know I'm not being stretched or grown here, but at least, at least I've got a great community and maybe that's worth more. Right, yeah. And and maybe it depends on the time in your life, too. Well, for sure. Maybe that wasn't hypothetical. <laughs> mm, I'll give you a toe tap for that. That was a lot of taps. That's, that's that cute. Actually, kind of exciting. <laughs> uh, Look at us. Your shoes and your shirt, my shoes and my shirt, Dave's. I- Na- Kinda. Naked foot and his Ugh, gross. naked I chest. I didn't get to see them. your dogs, bro. <laughs> That's sus. I just got a poke here. <laughs> <laughs> just got um, my, toe, my toes done. Dave, you are a professional podcaster because you mentioned, like, I think why some people le- leave the church and lose their faith is because of some of these things, which is a good segue to, you know, why the church might be creating the most atheists. 
but I did Google Melissa Doherty a little bit. She, ex-New Ager. I think there's some mm. of that experience, and I'm a curious... I'm a curious. I might go. I might go down a little rabbit hole on her just to. That sounded a little bit grosser than it needed to, but you know the thing. Uh, why was she in New Age, and what was her experience coming out of New Age? Because oftentimes that pendulum swings in a way where it's like, be really careful with meditation or anything seeking experience, because that's what she was all about in the New Age. Well, there are spir- spiritual things that are not of God. And I would imagine that she was delving deeply into those things. And the conflation of that is probably what she's alluding to is that people will start to like drift in there and think all spiritual things are of God. What, right. ki- what kind of things, Andy? I told you, Ghostbusters! Uh, well, the yeah, there's the occult. There's, there are, there's, there's evil in, there's evil in spirituality. The and, spirit of the boobies of this age? Mm. That's a spirit. That is. It is. I don't know what that means. I don't either. Yeah. That's the first time I've used those words in that order. I think maybe like, anyone ever. Uh, need that spirit. Uh, uh, yeah. No, I have a neighbor who, um, like speaking of the pendulum swinging, she, she doesn't do yoga because of the occult behind that. And I'm looking at her. Oh, I had no idea, but she's going on and on telling me about yogas or poses for worshiping, you know, deities and stuff like that. Are there Christian yoga poses that are acceptable? <laughs> like, uh, serious question. Just, the just, fallen cross. Is it all yoga? Oh, don't ask me. I have no, no. no idea. <laughs> I do know you could probably open up your pelvic floor to the devil in a way that's probably not great, d- uh, depending on the stretches. That might be impure. <laughs> that's the downward dog. <laughs> Wait, that's my favorite. Yeah. That's the only one I know. Of. Upward dog. <laughs> What's moon, up, dog? Moon, moon pose. <laughs> What's up, up, dog? All right, oh, we got another clip. Do we want to play the uh, the other? We one? do. Let me read a quote. Okay. So, our pastor on Sunday read a quote. Who's the pastor? Brandon, mm. and he wrote a qu- he read a quote from a Brennan. Brandon read Brennan. Brennan Manning. The greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him by their lifestyle. That's what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. So, any... any oh, sorry. I couldn't tell if you were done or not. <laughs> <laughs> any hot takes on, uh, or hot thoughts on that quote, or the idea that the church... That's the greatest single cause of atheism. That concept does not help. Uh, I don't. I don't know if it is this. Doesn't single, sit well with you. I, well, no, no, no. I'm just saying. I don't know if it's the, if it's the number one driver, but for sure, there's it's it's a contributor to a, a significant tr- contributor. People who come in and say and and view those who are ascribing to a religion, and their lives don't match up. And so, well, why, why would I believe that? Jesus says and does all of these things. You say you follow him, and yet you treat me like shit. Or, the, or these other people. Or you're uh, selfish. Or whatever. You know, insert, insert the thing. Um, then, of course, I think it's a natural reaction for people to go, well, I don't want to but clearly that's not right because even they don't believe it and they when they say that they do um the the fruit is not there um but i do also think that there's a flip side which there is there's people who who are um will fixate on the negative versions that are out there and and in, intentionally or unintentionally ignore the positives and say you know i'm i'm looking for reasons to say no and i will i will uh, let confirmation bias take over. And I think when's the last time you heard really, you know, great positive news about Christianity. Is there statistics on, but we're saying that the church is the number one cause of atheists of already non-believers. Like they weren't ever believers sent them deeper and versus believers that turn to become atheists. Cause I think no, it's I- two different I mean, I think what you're just talking about has more to do with people that 
weren't in the church yet versus i see what you're saying there's be, because, like a couple versions i mean right? if, if you're in the church i i think hopefully they're doing a, a decent job of we're all sinners obviously our humanity gets in the way therefore that's why like we're taught these things we yeah. don't always follow them yeah so yeah i don't mean to imply perfection by the way in that statement but i think you're right so they're Hey, I was at one at one point I would have said in my life I believed these things and then uh Christians themselves acted in such a way that made me say I I can't believe this anymore because if this is what this means if this is how it ends up then I don't want to be a part of that, right? Mm-hmm. Or I've been hurt to such a degree. And then the other part which you said which was why well, I would I've never said that I was a part of a church and from the outside looking in well, I don't like what I see, and therefore, um, and, and again, each one of these can be subject to confirmation bias, and you know, stack in the deck in your favor of wherever you want to go. Yeah. So, just a couple couple headlines that I found today that are all recent stories that might contribute to this idea, and don't get caught up on like okay, what's actually number one? That's not the point. The point is like, if the church is creating atheists, it's a problem. If you're in the church, it's, it's something to be addressed. Uh, Dr. Tony Evans, do you guys know that guy? You heard of him? Tony Evans. Pastor uh, of Dallas based mega church, Oak Hill Bible fellowship. I think he has a really Mm. popular book on fatherhood. I'm being a dad steps down from ministry. The reason given was due to sin. Uh, Robert Morris, this one might be the biggest one, largest church in Alabama. He's on the overseer board, used to be the pastor of a previous version of it way back in the day. He's an older man. Robert Morris resigns from Gateway Church. Um, oh, wait, is Gateway in Alabama? Yes. Oh, I just met someone who's... Oh, Dallas, sorry. Dallas, yeah, Dallas yeah. Mega Church. Why did I say Alabama? There, oh, there might be a headline coming up from <laughs> from <laughs> Alabama. <laughs> We're going to go there. Uh, he, he was the pastor at the time. This is 1980s, in the 1980s, where he molested a 12-year-old girl for about five years, 12 to 16-ish, and um, he referenced it and he he basically confessed to hey it wasn't intercourse but basically it was touching she alleges that it ended up with um rape via objects um and he's ba- he's obviously he went through restoration and maybe he is restored Th- this is the type of thing where it's like okay be restored and go to church but you don't be restored and um and get to be on the board of a church, like after something like that. Yeah. And by the way, Dallas just um, changed a law to where the statute statute of limitations won't apply. So there's potential that he could be facing criminal penalties due to this. Um, and then Bling Bishop, flashy Bling Bishop Whitehead. His real name is Bishop Lamar Miller Whitehead of Brooklyn, New York. Uh, sentenced to nine years in prison for fraud and extortion. He had a Brooklyn mega church. Um, again, Robert Morris, uh, SPC leader, former SPC leader, Paul Pressler accused of abuse. He died. He's 94. Southern but Baptist he, church. He had abuse. Um, many alleged abuses involving, uh, young men. Uh, I don't know all the details, but these types of things, like whether all the details are true or not, it's, it's, and you're, if you're connected to a church and you're, you've given li- your life to a church and then something like that happens, that is, can be earth shattering in a way that c- can cause you to question everything. Sure. And yeah. in a vacuum, if you're just looking at it on paper, it's like, well, that man isn't God. That man isn't Jesus. So your faith should be in Jesus. But that's not how. It still sucks. And it's, it sucks. And that's not how emotions and, and like identity ties work. Like when you tear away that identity and that gets, that gets, um, torn away, <laughs> I just said, um, it can result in my own 
to be slightly narcissistic in my own experience when certain things that I had really tied to my identity spiritually got pulled away from me. Uh, it it was painful, and it, you there is a big temptation to be like, well, off with my faith head, off with the head, you know, get rid of it. Uh, uh, the, maybe when you describe that, I don't know what you guys think if you've seen this or experienced this in uh, yourself as well, but oftentimes when you are connecting your uh, your personal faith uh, too closely with an individual, like mm-hmm. like a teacher, yeah, pastor, like a, teacher. a lead yeah. pastor, a teacher, and so uh, in some ways, y- your connection to your faith becomes dependent on that person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I think that's not that uncommon. Unfortunately, like we have, I think we've encouraged that culture in in the West and in in, uh, in Western culture of the church um, of the like the mega patch pastor mm-hmm. the like he- head quarterback, you know, uh, follow me to the ends of the earth type of uh, leadership role, which is not a biblical position. That's not the way that it was, uh, the church was intended to be. But when it's, it's no surprise that when we see uh, these, these people in these huge positions crash and burn, that there's tons of casualties along the way. Yeah. Yeah. And humans are communal animals and, and you want to belong and we're naturally drawn to leaders that can speak well and Care. speak with authority and got that riz. They got that riz. The no cap, bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're um, connecting to the younger crowd. <laughs> we're really reaching out to the youngins. <laughs> Tell a young friend. Hey, but fellow. not that young. <laughs> this is Bros Bibles and Beer. But I think you're right. Like Hey fellow kids. A lot of a congregate church's congregation is invested in the pastor, in the worship leaders, in the band. Yeah, it's especially it's, in the band, well, as it should be. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. It, Thank you. Finally, uh-huh. gosh, we never get. You guys we, get your dues. Yeah, but that it is a problem because that's actually not the way it's supposed to be. Yeah, it should never be about one person. Um, and you're putting your faith in man. Yeah. Versus where it's supposed to be. Right. God, you know, Jesus, God. God, man. God, man. <laughs> Jesus, man. And I think that there's some maturity that has to happen. Like, if you, can you separate, can someone uh, speak truths about something apart from their life? If if you find out something ab- about them like this, I'll wait. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. I'll wait. Uh, if you're not on YouTube already, you should be <laughs> because Trout. you're missing this. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on, but I'm excited. All right, Zach, you wanted to share this. It's time. <laughs> it's the, the latest tchotchke. All right. Oh, let's... The, the Mike Trout bobblehead. He's got a little bit of the Parkinson's. He's been touched, but uh, he's our faithful friend and he will watch over us. So thank you, Mike Speaking Trout. Of putting your faith in something. Yeah. Wow, Mike Trout bobblehead makes it up on the. Uh... Next to the Travelers. Credenza. I don't know what this is called. The bar. It's on the bar. Credenza. All right. So you were saying it. Continue, Andy. I don't even remember what I was saying. But <laughs> well, that's why I brought rate, that out. The idea- I was tired of whatever you were saying. let <laughs> 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 will spruce this up. I th- I'm kidding. I think I, the point that I was trying to make is um, it can be very difficult to try to separate the human from the, the, the concept. So... Can can someone who makes terrible mistakes in their life still communicate truths about God? Um, it can be really hard to separate those mm-hmm. things, and there's probably a certain point where you're like, I, I don't know what to do with this. But I'll pick I'll pick a really extreme example and see what you guys think. Um, I don't like it. <laughs> if the pastor of our church and Jeffrey Dahmer, were he still alive, gave the same exact sermon. And um, and let's just say that it could be examined by other most other common theologians as being accurate, true, and not controversial. Would you still be able to take away the the same level of truth? Were it delivered by each of those people? What producer Nate's shaking his head? Get on that mic. No, it's just my Closer. initial. Re- it's just my initial reaction is no. Yeah, 
And what it, spiritual experience am I having? <laughs> <laughs> You've just transcendentally meditated and Jeffrey Dahmer and your current pastor. I mean, it would not be unheard of for God to use a Jeffrey Dahmer potentially to be an example, put out a message. Now the question is, can you accept those words coming from him? Yeah, it's a good question. Actually, to get political, um, somebody who, well, most people don't love Biden or love Trump. Most people are like, I hate the other guy more. So, but for whatever reason, Biden's not wrong all the time. Like not everything he's going to say is going to be wrong. Well, because a broken clock is right twice a day. And the same goes with Trump. Yeah, man. And I, yeah. I can say that equally yes. about both of them yes. personally as a vehement nonpartisan, but I'm a hero. I know, <laughs> but, uh, it doesn't matter what one of them says. The people that are on the other team are going to find a way to disagree with it. And I think the same applies to a repulsive character that might be speaking truth in a certain mm -hmm. area. The gut reaction might not to be, let's glean, hey guys, let's glean the good truths from a, a mass murderer. Uh, it's easy no. to throw it out because it's it's just a repulsive character, even though he might, there might be gold in one of his speeches or whatever. But if you don't know who he is, then it wouldn't matter. Yeah. But if you're on a team, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. And so when you're a part of a mega church with a very charismatic leader, the tendency will be to, we're behind this guy. He's awesome. And maybe 95% of the stuff he says is awesome. And then later on you find out, oh, there's rumors that he might've been inappropriate with somebody on the staff. And the, the impulse is to just defend, defend the team you're on because mm -hmm. we're, we're pack animals. Like literally there's, the what what was the Kool-Aid? It wasn't Kool-Aid, it was Rite Aid. It wasn't Hellbop. Rite Aid. That's a store. You're talking about Hellbop? Yeah, they took they killed themselves. Mm -hmm. Kool-Aid gets blamed no. on it. But it was pow it wasn't Power Aid. Good grief. It was a different aid. Bill Johnson. Bill Johnson. That's <laughs> that's Bethel. <laughs> <laughs> that's the Bethel. Bill guy. Johnson from Bethel. He's the one. <laughs> no, yes, but they, they that's where the term they, that's where the term drink the Kool-Aid yeah. came from. But it wasn't actually Kool-Aid. No. Kool-Aid doesn't deserve that, even though it's garbage. It was too. Gatorade. But maybe. they killed maybe it does. themselves. And right before they did, one person, one woman spoke up and was like, guys, we what are we doing? Like, let's turn around. What what is happening right now? But everyone's like, nope. Shut this, up, woman. Drink the Kool-Aid. This is how we get there. She she drank it because in that moment, she would rather experience yeah. physical death than communal death, mm -hmm. than the death of her tribe Jim and relationships. Jones. Jim Jones. Yeah, it there was Jim, jo Jones. Jim Jones. There was a J involved. Yeah, yeah, you were much. close. You were good. Yeah. It was Jones Aid. <laughs> Jonestown <laughs> Massacre. Yeah. And so, I mean, think about that. Mm -hmm. She chose death over the death of her tribe, over losing that connection to people. So I think that's what's going on. A lot of these people, the the older guy that molested the 12-year-old that I hope he gets p penalized now. I mean, th the idea that it's coming out now and then, oh, statute of limitations. So it's kind of like it didn't happen. That is just, that makes me want to throw up too. So... But he got back on and restored, and he created a ministry around restoring fallen pastors. Right. And so maybe there's a place for that. I don't want, because you sin and you lose your ministry, therefore you can't come to church. I don't want that to be a thing. I right. want there to be restoration. But a lot of times people don't even lose their ministries because like... um well, they ask the, for forgiveness. Like the blood cells that yeah. come in to fight infection, oftentimes when there's allegations of something, the congregation comes around and tries tries to protect the organization sure. because of the social cohesion, mm -hmm. and we don't want to disturb that. And so that's there's a real psychological aspects that are at play that work against like, oh, new information, let's go this way because that way is bad. We don't do yeah. that until it reaches a breaking point. Uh, the whole time you were... Describing that, I was just thinking of David in the Bible. Me? Oh. David Ritchie. Uh, David in the Bible, like, he's, he's, there's plenty of examples of he knew better. 
Um, and which, which is tough because God still used him. And God still used him. Yeah, crack that sucker. Um, nice. <laughs> and and like he committed adultery. Had the had her husband basically sent him to d- to death. I mean, he yeah. really he raped her. I mean, he took. She didn't have a choice. Yeah. I think we, sometimes we interpret it as like, well, she kind of knew if she was on the roof that... That's well, good to be the king. Yeah. Well, it was very good for David and that, that's Solomon. That's a quote from Very, a movie. very, very good. Uh, it's Tom Petty. It's good to be king. That's what. Uh, that's probably what he was referring to. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's no, the that the world, Mel Brooks. Um, but in spite of that, like... Now, clearly, there was repentance, deep, deep repentance that's recorded in the Bible. There at least, and without us knowing anymore, I'll I'll just take that story at, at its va- face value. Yeah, repentance that didn't happen until the prophet came to him was like, "Dude, you be tripping." Sure. Uh, the what I don't want to get lost from Nathan the yeah, prophet. What I don't want to get lost is like the point I'm trying to make is we we uh, we're talking about bad behavior and leadership and how that sometimes gets covered over but how that can deeply negatively affect mm-hmm. uh, a church body. And, and it brings up so many questions. Yeah. And, uh, and so when we, David is one example of God choosing to use flawed people. For me, the question comes down to like, how flawed and to what degree will, will they, is it okay for them to be used? Because I don't think God calls us to no longer be logical. Hey, you had inappropriate relationships with, underage girls okay well guess what it's never ever going to be okay for you to be a youth pastor from now on out yeah restoration does not mean that we shut off our brains right yeah right yeah. or you in forgiveness put that with restoration you're forgiven maybe even the the victims forgive you but no at this church you don't get to play that role anymore you can come sure but those are those are the things. Even the David stuff is like we're we're all we're we're reading we're reading narratives in the Bible that also don't always line up. Like it's if you were to do side by side, and we don't need to make a mountain out of this molehill, but in Kings, it lists David's conquests, good and bad, and it's pretty brutal about the bad. In Chronicles, some of those same stories have taken out some of the bad things. It's like David's PR department was like, hey, let's uh, let's massage Redacted. this a little bit, which is pretty fun. There's only so much papyrus. What do you think? It grows on trees? <laughs> Look, but but they this, had to edit. This is part of the atheism, like why people become atheists. And this applies to me, which was like, really reading some of these stories and when you're told the Bible is perfect and God basically wrote it. And then you read some of these stories and you find these differences and you find where the text is self-correcting and it's different traditions from different times telling the same stories, but in different ways, it really throws you. Look, what you're really describing is that Chronicles was the original shorts and reels. Okay. Yeah. There's only so much time and space to that's right. It's out of context. Got out of context. <laughs> we've only we've got a limited amount of space to get our point across oh here. Oh my gosh! Nice. And so that's what we got to do. Yeah, but if you want, there's another clip. Um, the window that is why I am an atheist. Did Richie you want a little bit more? Please, a little something. What do you What do you feel like, little Elijah? Elijah. Uh, the biblical. most the most biblical. That yeah, yeah okay. that's why I brought it. Thank you. It's blessed. I got some Elijah Craig. It's ordained. Say when. When. Just a little bit. Day. Just a taste. So this is a. I I searched on YouTube why I became. Mm. What do you think the first thing popped up? Okay. Transgendered. So it was Catholic. Oh. Oh. And number two. By the way, you know that a furry. Your search is personalized. (laughs) <laughs> no, not on DuckDuckGo because I'm not signed in. That oh, was a total you, I thought vanilla. you were doing it on yeah. YouTube. Total va- it was on YouTube, but it was a vanilla, not signed into YouTube, vanilla. So it gave me why I became a Catholic. Now, 
my computer's probably listening. So somehow well, I became lines. an atheist. Atheist. Atheist was well, number four. Well, I don't want to tell you agnostic. <laughs> yeah, know. we have somebody that works for Google. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> this is how it really works. I don't want to say that we. So it knows my sign in, whether or yeah. not I'm signed in. I don't want to say that we know, but I don't want to say that we don't. Know. I know you know. Face recognition. <laughs> Wait, so what was second? Muslim. Oh, oh, interesting. What was third? Uh, I think it was third or fourth was atheist. I don't remember. All right. Why I became an atheist, and the first five results were all Christian apologetics about debunking atheism, and I'm like. Wow, they they somehow nestled their way into the algorithm in a in a good way. But I was looking for an atheist, so I don't know anything about this individual. But this is why they became an atheist. Hit it, Nate. Oh, no, I became an atheist three, four years ago because I realized the more I started questioning the faith, the more I started asking questions to the elders. They refused to answer my questions or church. they didn't have an answer. That's church related. And I'm a person that likes to know. I don't want to be led by faith because I don't feel like faith is a constructive way to lead. It's not, it's, it doesn't help. I like when people answer my questions. So when I started asking a lot of questions and it couldn't be answered, I realized, you know, maybe it's not for me. So hence why to this day, I've been an atheist. And honestly, I've been so much happier All right, you can as probably, an atheist. You can pause it. So ignore that last part, but it's so, obviously he's still an emotional guy. You can tell like sure. there's, there's a lot of emotion and experience involved there, but the the questions questions aren't being answered or they're too difficult and so they go unanswered. I think that's a big one. I, I file that under like the church creating atheists in that his specific church. Um so I think it applies. I think I'd be interested to see if there was if there would be another side of that interpretation. Here's one thing that struck me. I I'm making this up because I don't know anymore. But I have encountered people who have said similar things to what he said. And they're asking hard questions to which there are not direct, clear answers to and are never satisfied that there are not clear answers to those things. And the fact that he said, I don't want to take anything by faith. I think that's probably the strongest indicator. Like, I don't think any... I, I just imagine some of those elder, elders saying, I don't know if there's an answer that I could give you that would satisfy you. Right. Yeah. And so uh, maybe that the fact that he says, I don't like taking things by faith. Oh, well, that might be why you're an atheist because being a Christian requires faith. Right. Well, the bad news and the good news is. But I like that track. It was dope. Everybody has faith. I got more and more you're hearing people that don't believe in God that are evolutionary psychologists um, or sociologists or people that study human beings and behavior. Uh, Jonathan Haidt comes to mind. Hey! Uh, people, faith is in our DNA. Like, not technically, but People are wired. It's very apparent that a driver. whether you're Christian or not, Muslim or not, you are driven to worship and and don't don't think of worship as like singing and praise and lifting your hands. Just think of like believing in something. Atheism uh, is a version of faith. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And ultimately, Still well, a community. I think for a lot of Christians that become atheists, they rely on God of the gaps type theories where it's like, I can't explain this. It must be God. That question gets over history. Think of all the questions that we used to attribute to God that get answered by science and it's sure. demonstrable. And it just, it, if you're not, depending on your perspective, it's like, oh, we're boxing God out. So, like rationalism, reason, science is boxing God out because now we can explain these things. And so if you're reliant on like, oh, we don't know this, so therefore God, and plenty of Christians do the God, a version of God of the gaps. Um, guess what? God loses every time. If your definition of the way God works is like God is active in all, all those things. I don't think it works that way, but well, ultimately there's mystery. There's mystery everywhere. The more, the more science is unpacking about the nature of the, like the big bang is being questioned right now. People are starting to push back against the theory of Darwin's evolution this doesn't mean it's a six-day creation and 24 hours out of nothing, but 
but like le- legit scientists that aren't Christians are like, hey, there's a lot of questions we have about this and we're going to start to test this. So there's mystery everywhere, whether you're a Christian or not. And I think that's what most people miss. So his when he mentions faith, I'm like, oh, you're using faith in a really shitty way. Like, well, I felt if, like he dropped the ball there. And if it's not if if it's not surrounded by people who are also just demonstrating the best of Christian values, like which you is know. like nobody. <laughs> well, but you know what I mean. Like, speak for yourself, Dave. Well, come yeah, on. Dave. If you came to church, maybe you'd see it every we all once have our in a faults. while. Yeah, uh, but but the, my point is like if if he's if if that was a church where he felt like he wasn't seeing Christianity and it's at its core being lived out um, in in a truthful way, then it's like a deadly combination. He's got he's left with questions that he's really wrestling with, and he doesn't have a community of believers who love him and care for him and are demonstrating um, Christ's love to him. So yeah, I, I'm making a huge jump leap and. You know, yeah. speculation on that second one. If that's the case, I get it, dude. That's a hard place to be because you don't have n- neither of those things. Do you have to fall back on? Yeah. And earlier, before I went on my last diatribe, when you were talking about there not being answers to some of these things, and so you get disappointed and you leave. I I don't disagree. That's a thing. But in my own personal life, in my in my all my thinking and whatnot with, with the stuff, my favorite answers have been, that's a really good question. I don't know. And this is from like Titans, pe- people that like know and study God yeah. and like do like legit theologians. We are not legit theologians. We're no. bro theologians. Oh my gosh. YouTube yes. commenters. Uh, I get it. I know why you're doing what you're doing, but like, <laughs> seriously, look at us. <laughs> <laughs> But guess what? Most of you are like us, so step back. Um, I like. Yeah, the I think conversations comments. like this would actually help bring yeah more people. That's the in. hope. No, when I, I mean, and when I hear a pastor say, "I don't, I don't know," that's a great question, and I struggle with that too. Instant points, instant credibility, yeah. and I don't go the other direction. I'm like, this is somebody I can trust. Whereas a lot of the answers I got to questions, well, yeah, just. Let scripture interpret scripture, which is like a bumper sticker slogan for like, this is confusing over here. Find the answer in another part of the Bible. But that's not how the Bible works. I got once, um, if you have that question, you need to pray on it and you'll get your answer. Yeah. <laughs> which I'm like, uh, okay. So, and you probably- have, So you- have <laughs> premarital sex? <laughs> <laughs> I got a yes. No. As long as nobody shakes the bed, it's okay. Yes, you <laughs> said. I'll be the jump pumper. You told me I could pray yeah. about this. <laughs> well, and I, kind of back to my earlier point. I feel so that that clip where he's like, "I don't want to." Faith isn't enough for me. Yeah. Your point is like, okay, that's probably the issue. But then, conversely, maybe the community or the church he's going to isn't where he should be. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where, okay, you maybe need to expand your horizons, check out some other places. You know, it shouldn't be an automatic, I don't you know, believe anymore. Yeah. Um, and that's, there's just my people that like, just if they're not getting the answers they want, okay, I'm done. I'm out until something changes, you know, in them. Yeah. Yeah. That's hard. The two things that came to mind were, um, gosh, dude, I love, Maybe one of my favorite um, parts of scripture is um, your loins are on fire. The guy who comes to Jesus <laughs> and is like <laughs> his his daughter has died, and he's like, "Go back." She'll she's basically he tells her she's okay, and his comment of "I believe" help my unbelief. Like, dude, that is the most human passage in the entire Bible. I'm convinced of it. Like. That that is should be the summary of our Christian faith, because to your point, we all have those visceral reactions to someone who's like instantly has a bumper sticker answer to everything. You're like, well, I don't believe you because the world doesn't just doesn't seem to work that way. Yeah, it, like my, uh, it's not that clean. It's not all that packaged up and and right. sanitized the way that you've described yeah. it. And so 
there is a part of me that like has that we do wrestle with unbelief and if we don't then we're either fooling ourselves or we're not paying attention close enough and and so i think it's our job as we mature in our christian faith to sort through those things and ask god like i love that he's asking jesus in the middle of he's like i believe i do believe there's a part of me that doesn't it's still not quite there yeah what's well, honesty Right. It yeah. feels real. Right. And we've all experienced that. Yeah. And it, it goes to the heart of faith. Faith isn't certainty. No, that doesn't require faith. Yeah. And I think that's where I was personally. I can't recommend if you're sort of a Christian that wonders about deconstruction or has people deconstructing that you want to help. Or you're deconstructing. Pete Inn's book, The Sin of Certainty, is a great reference or a great resource because it it just, he touches on some of the things that the Bible says that are problematic for people that are testing things. And he, he really drills into faith. What does faith actually mean? And you can have faith like, like me as sort of an agnostic Christian, but still considers myself a Christian. Agnostic just means I, I don't know but I believe certain things and I'm hopeful for certain things. And I think that's okay. And I'm not closed off. Yeah. Like hopefully you can get to a place where you're, you're in a position where you don't just angrily reject and run the other direction from your traditions. Like traditions are there for a reason. Like there's ironclad truths in every tradition that shouldn't be just discarded and I think the danger of deconstruction, and it, this yeah. is weird for me to say, it's like, it, it is like, just test everything. Paul says, test everything, cling on to what's good. And that involves your tradition too. I like uh, friend bro of the bo- uh, podcast, Art Greco's uh, description of it. I think he the way he describes is he says- um, He gets a shout out and feedback coming up. Oh, nice. He- uh, he will say, uh, "This is this is what I'm convinced of right now, right think, now." Yeah, that's at a this key. Moment. He's like, "That's good." I don't know everything, but right now, this is what I'm convinced of, and it and like the unspoken piece of that is, uh, I'm willing to change my mind with new information mm-hmm. if that comes along. And so, what? And, and how old is he? Uh, like twice as old as us. <laughs> So he's, he's, but you look great, Art. I mean, you don't look well, twice. He's not uh, twice. I, I think, think that's he's, a mature. I think he's seventy. That's like a mature, which doesn't always happen. I mean, there's plenty of you yeah. Know, he's set not in our ways. ninety. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm just, sorry, Art. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I did it for the gram. He looks great for ninety. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, he's seventy. Good on you, Art. He's seventy. He's but been on a few drinking? times. Look him up on our podcast, Art, Art Greco. Greco. But I mean, but that's a healthy way to look at it yeah so that's why I, that's why i said it <laughs> good job andy <laughs> it is a healthy way to, to to do it and i think we should all be doing that we should all be striving towards getting healthier mm-hmm. and like maturing in all things our faith included you know like we manage our emotions differently now than we did when we were 16 years old that's a good thing to do we should manage our faith differently than we did when we were 16 years old yeah the more you know um okay so we're gonna do, get to listener feedback in a second but i'm excited about that do you want to just very briefly the church what can the church do better to prevent atheism we haven't said it directly but there's been a few references that i think we've said maybe we'll call out a couple i'll, I'll mention one that i've heard us kind of indirectly describe one is like um, uh, discuss the elephant in the room. So when when we encounter something that's like ugly or inappropriate or um, you know seems seems like it's anti what we what we tend to believe in Christianity, some behavior like we described these pastors that had uh, were caught for bad behavior. I'm not just. Dis- I'm not saying we need to describe in detail, but be forthright about that. Bring that to the front and say, "What this person did was wrong. We don't agree with it. Here's what we're doing about it." 
don't sweep it under the carpet right. and try to oh, make own it, it. Yeah, and, own it and don't. And make from it. my perspective, I would include like, just say what happened. Don't do the moral failure thing. Don't do like it was serious sin. Name yeah. name it because mm-hmm. that name is it, authentic. It. Name it and claim that sin. <laughs> That's Rose what, Bibles and beer. Well, and name, that, name it, it and claim, claim it. it. That is biblical. You know, you need to bring bring it out into the light, as they say. Yeah. Well, which, which it, confession is supposed to be one of the uh, pillars yeah. of Christianity. And by the way, confession, when it's honest and authentic, is good for the confessor. Like it literally the most, lifts the most. Yeah, lifts burdens. Okay. What? Else, where are some other ones? Um, how do we fix the atheism train? For me, of- like when going apologetic cliches. I, if you're really into apologetics and and you think you have like bumper sticker like this disproves atheism, this should disprove your doubt. It it never does. There's always more uh, layers to that puzzle. So just just be honest about it. I think the idol of inerrancy that most Christians hold that don't see it as an idol. And I don't use idol like they're in danger of hell or anything, but I think most Christians cling to like the Bible is perfect. God wouldn't make mistakes. God gave us the Bible. There's more to that story when you study it carefully, even in, especially when you learn scholarship in the actual languages, but even in the English languages, when you compare the gospel, there's, they had different takes on it and that's okay. I think, Acknowledging that it's okay that the writer of Mark decided to write to to not include birth narratives at all and the details of the resurrection and and uh, that's is that inerrancy though? Yeah, beca- because the details don't line up. You can't you can't create a perfect puzzle where all the gospel stories. But that's not what in, the definition of inerrancy. There's no is. errors. But that doesn't have to be an error that that all the details don't match up differently. I, I, th- right? I think for most, even with your definition, it, it, it <laughs> I don't, I don't did give one yet, but I don't. Well, so if the timelines don't make sense and it literally can't be factually true in every gospel narrative, most Christians try to harmonize those by creating a, a sort of a messy fifth gospel where they try to include everything, I think- but that doesn't makes sense. I think the dominant theological perspective for the last 2000 years has been that that it's okay to have different perspectives that each gospel is intending to give a a different angle narrative and that I think that for they, some yes. For, I think that is the dominant theological for, for most American evangelicals if you if you tell them hey what what Mark says over here is impossible to to match up with what Matthew says over here about the same event I think that co- because they're leaving out details. No, there's like there's, they're you, just different. You just they're just different. You can't you can't. And I know I don't have examples off the top of my head, but there there are examples. I know what you're talking. The story about. of Samson. You, if you look at Samson's life, like there there's stuff that just doesn't doesn't line up. There's two different creation stories like that don't line up. So all of this falls under inerrancy. Mo- I would say maybe not technically. I've heard definitions. Of, I'm spending way more time on this than I plan on. I know. But um, the definition of inerrancy, I've heard that kind of massage these, but it ends up be, becoming just sort of a, like, that's not inerrancy anymore. But regardless, if you're trying to protect the Bible from itself by creating structures that so that everything lines up, that is creating atheists, whether we like it or not. Because Christians that love the Bible and start to really pay attention and have questions, if you're trying to make it all work. If like, you're trying to, yes, if you're trying, th- I think what you're trying to say is there are wrong ways to read the Bible. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I'm, I'm try- probably trying to say more than that, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think you are trying to say more than that, but like ultimately, there's, there's lots of wrong ways to read the Bible. And and people do that often. And w- well, but, there's but way to preach the Bible too. when you when you read the Bible, there's I don't think there's one right way to read the Bible to where the Bible is all lined up. So if you if you need the Bible to be perfect because God gave it and God doesn't make mistakes, I'm just saying, trust me, this is where Christians become atheists 
because they were told the Bible is one thing and they discover, oh no, it was written by humans. And from my perspective, it's okay. Humans wrote it. Mm -hmm. There's going to be human elements. There's going to be human aspects that yeah. aren't perfect. I'll avoid the rat hole. I got what you're saying. I won't. I won't t send us on another topic. Let it. Let it be shown uh, that Andy really wants to go down this rabbit hole. I think you should go down the rabbit hole. Maybe no, we'll, no, no. But we'll well, he said rat hole technically. But All right. did I say rat hole? You Put said a button on this, Dave. What do you think, Dave? Uh, you want to know the biggest difference between Amazon and Google working there? Amazon would always refer to them as rat holes, and at uh, Google, Google, it would be rabbit holes. Which one's correct? They'd be like, look, we don't want a rat hole down this topic. <laughs> it was like, oh. Well, that, which that means nobody wants to go down a rat, rat hole. hole. No. They might so go down a rabbit hole. Some good hey, maybe we should avoid this rabbit hole at Google. Like rabbits no. are mean. I'd go to the rats. I have two rabbits. They're okay. <laughs> Vile animals. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. Uh, put your butt my, on. My, I think kind of what I touched on earlier would, would be that I think, in general, if churches and pastors, small C churches, could teach and preach and be, be come together as a community of from love versus concrete. Um, I mean, not and not every church is this way, but be open to answering questions and and talking to the people that are coming with those questions and being open and honest that maybe you need to seek another place, like not to force people out, but mm. like if you're having these questions and not feeling like you're connected here, you know, there, there's probably a, another place for you. And it yeah. seems like sometimes the churches are so like, no, we have to keep numbers, our people numbers, numbers. and we need our donations and we need to keep this thing going. And that yeah. the idea that not ev not one church is right for everybody. Thank goodness. And exactly, that's what we need. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of churches that get that, that don't think that way. Yeah. The body of Christ is diverse. All right. Just pretend I played the feedback jingle. And uh feedback, feedback. Here we go. Aww, Andy feedback. Seen it. This is on the in response to the Harrison Butker episode. Episode from D Brock ten fourteen. With energy. <laughs> Thank you for the encouragement. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. We're getting to the end of the episode. I could feel it. Yeah. Yeah, we were It's midnight, in. East Coast time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I love you and your podcast, but mostly your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I received that. <laughs> Number two, your podcasts have pushed me further into my own deconstruction slash proper alignment from bad religion and interpretation to Jesus. I think that's a compliment. I yeah. love bad religion. I think we just talked about that. A quick shout out to Zach. By the way, spelled Z-A-Q-U-E. Solid. Wow. Zach-Que. <laughs> quick shout out to Zach for his transparency. I was wearing clothes. Uh, number three, art is my spirit animal. Yeah. Nice. Art wasn't involved in that episode, but we'll just take that. That's fine. I don't know where that came from, but that's great. To the point, my wife and I were traveling and listening to a couple of your podcasts, one of which was about Bucker's commencement comments. One, I think it's important to understand that his comments were made to a group of conservative Catholics who, as much as we know, have always been taught birth control is bad. So if two young conservative Catholic college grads are going to get married, there is a strong likelihood they're going to be kicking it for days. And there's also a strong likelihood someone will get pregnant. I'm thinking... The woman in that scenario, abortion out of the question, so what to do? Enter Butker's speech. Early on, my wife and I agreed that she would stay home and raise our litter. They had puppies? Or kittens. Or kittens. Interesting. Wait, is are kittens a litter as well? Yeah. I believe so. Yeah. Uh, Producer Nate, can you double check on that? I'm on are it. kittens a litter? <laughs> Just take a look I know at that. Something's a gaggle. I don't remember what it is. But. Geese are a gaggle. Oh, there we go. Murder of crows. I don't think it's a litter of kittens. Uh, I, it think it's a, a, I think it's a dumpster of kittens. <laughs> 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 technically, it's a cardboard box of kittens. But it's called a litter box. I think that's what it's called. It's, it's called a litter box. It's an Austin 6th Street of kittens. Cardboard box of kittens. <laughs> it was a massive sacrifice, but it was also our unified decision. However, we knew a lot of families where both parents work and it works for them. Their kids are equally as adjusted as ours, if not more so, and we don't even homeschool them. 
Zing. Number two, the housing market, even rent is a killer right now. Loads of college debt, low paying entry level jobs, high rent mortgage. A new baby means there's a strong possibility that yeah. they can't survive on one income. What do they do then? Suck it up, live in extreme poverty, rent in a destabilized community so they can afford rent. There's a huge reality that I thought y'all overlooked. Oh, I think he's describing a huge reality that we overlooked. Although I did say like, you know, whatever. It's hard. Go listen to it. It's hard. The big one. During your podcast, I paused it and asked my wife her thoughts. Note, we were both raised in conservative Christian environments, so we're down with strong family units. She stated that if she had heard Butker's comments on the day of her commencement after completing four years of a very difficult journey, those words would have crushed her. She had a dream, and to have all that effort and dream brushed to the side to accept the vocation of mom with no end date would have made her feel devalued. I think we kind of touched on We addressed that a we little bit. We might have. Uh, Maybe not well I, enough for I, him. I get that, though. I mean, having just come off of uh, spending a few days in, in Texas at Baylor University with my daughter, I think if, uh, it sounds crude to say this, but like <laughs> if at the commencement speech, I would have heard someone saying that and I'd be like, I just paid how much money for what? <laughs> 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 no, that that isn't the point. But I, uh, You're right, I like, validate those, uh, those feelings, those sentiment. I, I think that's true. And we, I think we just looked at it as a home game. We're like, yeah. You've got conservative uh, Catholics talking to conservative Catholics. It's it's not out of the ordinary. Yeah. But the timing, maybe there's a group of folks in there who wouldn't have appreciated that. And so he, maybe. he closes it out with the major point here is that I asked a female about a female's perspective. You literally talked on behalf of women. What are the collective years of marriage between the three of you? 65 years. Uh, so okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Wait a minute. We did personally talk- on behalf of women everywhere. I cringe. So I cringe at some of the things you said. If only you weren't so freaking lukewarm. Again, I love you and your podcasts, but mostly your podcasts. Okay, is that a joke? The lukewarm part. Luke- I think the lukewarm part is a joke. We did talk about our our wives. Yes, and our wives weren't on the podcast, and so sometimes you do have to speak on someone's behalf if they're not in the room. So. Uh, and by the way, and, we, and I don't think that any of us, if our wives were, if they listen to our podcast, I mean, yeah, when, I, don't when, when, I mean, when, when yeah. our wives listen to our podcast, I hear from Lisa every time. Yeah. No, I think, I, I don't think we misrepresented their positions. In fact, we were just kind of re- repeating what he just did. By no, the way, he didn't say we, we talked on behalf of our wives. He said we spoke on behalf of women, which I vehemently disagree no. with. Well, I didn't like do we're just we're voicing opinions By as the way, dudes. He spoke on behalf of his wife too. She should have entered did, into the comments and, on her own. And he did. Hey, I love. Dunk. Hey, <laughs> D Brock, I love this comment. And with all due respect, when you said you literally talked on behalf of women, but you said personally and behalf of all women everywhere, I cringed at some of the things you said. So oh, wait, <laughs> so so you're doing it too. And by the way, it's just opinions, and we're, we reserve the right to change them, and they're probably wrong, and that's what'd okay. What would you say that would make him cringe? I don't know. I think the fact that... Dude, I don't know what we said. I mean, I it could see probably, Jeff saying something. It was probably something Jeff said. But, and by the way, so that's probably really where you need to direct your vitriol is towards Jeff. It's Jeff at brosbiblesbeer.com. You can get a hold of him directly. But uh, text is a poor way to interpret somebody's actual thoughts, so if we really got it wrong, let us know. Uh, but... But that was a long response, and I loved it. I have a couple of short too. ones now. Okay. I really appreciate that. Thank you, sir, um, if I can be so bold to call you sir. Uh, Josh. On behalf of all the men in the world, be- I'd like to say thank you. <laughs> Josh Gibson, 3248. As a progressive, I was really annoyed with people getting on a conservative person at a conservative college speaking to conservative people for saying conservative things. It was <laughs> How could you? It was fine. Like it makes leftists seem like crazy people when we do something like this. And he's qu- calling himself a leftist. So I like that. And that was one of our points is like, he's conservative and he said conservative things. What's his name again? Josh Gibson. That's a bot. <clears throat> he has numbers behind his name, doesn't he? <laughs> well, by definition, 
YouTube gives you numbers when you sign up for YouTube. Not mine. Because you changed it. No, because I'm original. No, he, he, he's because you one. changed it originally. No, I, said, I had numbers when I first signed up and I, I didn't did. change it. I didn't. Well, I did. <laughs> well, I then he should change it. I don't think that's a bot. By the way, if you're not a, if you're not a bot, do. change it. That is a bot, by the way. That's totally a bot. And finally, we had... Andy wrote the uh, program. I know how bots work. We had a short, Good Parents Can Forgive, Can God, which was based on the story that you told about the the people forgiving their murderer of their kid. Uh, Jesus, uh, The Wayward Pilgrim. Jesus wasn't killed or murdered. He has the power to lay his life down and take it up again. Jesus also did not die for our sins. The entire point was to completely destroy our ancient enemy, death. It was by Adam's sin that death entered to God's creation. It was by Jesus, the second Adam, that death was vanquished. Discover an Orthodox church near you. (laughs) I need a whiteboard. Interesting. By the way... When and if I leave the current church I go to and I have been involved in for 20 years, it might be something with a little more... Gusto? Like, Catholicism... Liturg- liturgical? Yeah. Hmm. Catholicism right now is has good PR. Oh, you're getting on that Candace Owens train. A lot of... Uh, hmm. Now I'm not. Now that you said her name, I'm going to go the other... <laughs> Oh, you're getting on that Jordan Peterson's wife's train. Uh, that's hard. Oh, you're getting on that Russell Brand train. He's not Catholic, but th- c- these things are happening. But the, the, the uh, because there's process and there is ritual and there's tangible ways to practice your faith in a way that I think a that's lot cool. of a lot of like mainstream evangelical churches is like there's there's less ritual. And so we look at ritual as like bad and like, oh, you're doing works. But no, for a lot of people, the ritual is like, I am practicing my faith. These things represent something transcendent. Mm -hmm. And so I confess, Lisa and I have talked about visiting Eastern Orthodox churches. Um, It'd be fun. Fun maybe is the wrong word. Let's go. But yeah, let's yeah, do it. To, to see how other people trip. practice field, their I faith. Mean, field trip, not road trip. Because for a lot of evangelicals, for a large section of my life, is like, I think those guys are probably Christian, but they do all that weird stuff. And now it's like, no, people can be Christian in a lot of different ways. And so, well, and the but Pope I, is I'm so glad you allow that. <laughs> yeah. Zach, on behalf of all people everywhere, is telling you <laughs> that you can be a Christian in other ways. Oh okay? my gosh. <laughs> I love the you spoke on behalf of women. It's a, on behalf of women. I caught you speaking on behalf of women. I don't speak on behalf you? of any dude, bro. It's it's like you don't even speak on behalf of us. <laughs> exactly. That's the point of the podcast. I know. It's so good. Like there was a couple times where we were like that statement is problematic, but we're moving on, you know? Yeah. And you just leave it alone because it's it was cuz we're humans and we're not robots, yeah. Unlike most of our listeners, <laughs> most of the bot, most I'm, of the bots. I'm only, I'm genuinely halfway kidding. Fifty. You 50, do a halfway. service to our audience. Fifty fifty. They are human. If individuals. he comes back next week, Josh, one, two, three, four, five, six. If you come back next <laughs> week and do another comment and be more specific, then I'll know. But guess what, guys? AI is getting pretty damn good, and I smell AI. Can you smell what AI Rock is cooking? I can definitely smell that we've been in an enclosed space for a long time, and it smells like dude in here. Yeah. So on smell. behalf of all dudes. <laughs> <laughs> Not women. Find us everywhere at Bros Bibles and Beer. Hit us, or sorry, Bros Bibles Beer on the socials. Hit us up, subscribe, like, rate, review, whatnot. But um, thank you, Nate. Nasty Nate, the Nasty. nastiest of all Nates. Yes. Cheers to you, brother. Thanks, dude. Cheers. You're you're still fired, but you'll be back, I'm sure. Dave Ritchie, Andy <laughs> McCraw. <laughs> the once in future fired. <laughs> uh, I have been Zach Crater. Grace Peace. Cheers, dudes. Cheers. Thanks for having me. <laughs> oh man.